All right, well, in today's episode, we are going to take a look at worship in the new heavens and the new earth, the worship that will take place in eternity. Now, if you're familiar with Revelation in the in the study that we've been that we've been doing um, on this podcast, you understand that what is laid out in Revelation, um, most of it is written and communicated in symbolic language. So, the things that we're going to encounter in our text today are they things that are going to be uh, that we should understand in a wooden literal sense. Um, I think. If you, if you know me by now, you know the answer to that question. The, the answer to that question is no, but um, it does give us insight. See, because again, the symbols are supposed to give us a vividness of, of the reality of what's being communicated. And um, just as it relates to worship, I mean, we're going to see um, the participants of this worship um, and what that has to do with our closeness to our God. Um, and also just kind of an- answer some of the questions just as, as far as it relates to, you know, terms like the kings of the earth and the nations bringing their glory into the new Jerusalem. What is that all about? You know, that might raise some questions in people's minds when they, when they read that portion of scripture in the book of Revelation. What are we talking about there? Well, we're going to tackle um, those subjects today as we finish up Revelation chapter 21. So we're going to finish up today, and then we're just going to have one more chapter um, to go through uh, before we finish the book. So pretty, uh, some pretty exciting things uh, to look into. I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. All right, Revelation chapter twenty-one. We're like I said, we're going to we're going to finish up uh, this chapter finally. We've been in chapter twenty-one um, for a handful of weeks, um, at least four. I think we've been here for four weeks, um, and so this will be our fifth. I think I, I not I'm not taking careful enough attention to. to in my mind to go back and think, um, but at, I, I would say at least four, uh, and this will be at least our, our fifth. Um, and I guess really in Revelation chapter 20 and 21 combined, we've been in the, those two chapters for for quite a while, uh, pretty much for for most of the summer. Um, and I make no apology for that. I think that uh, there are a lot of things that we needed to delve deep into, get to the root of the meaning of certain things so that we could have a better understanding of what's being communicated to us. But we're going to finish Revelation chapter 21, and as I said just a few seconds ago, um, that will leave us with one more chapter left in the book of Revelation. I I anticipate, and I would guess that uh, as far as how many episodes we're gonna we're gonna spend on that, um, no more than four, I would say. So that gives you a little bit of an understanding after this after this episode, you know, just how close we are. Um, how close we are to finishing. Um, when we get into chapter 22, one of the things that you're going to see is that there are some repeat things, uh, kind of in a conclusionary sort of way, um, that we've encountered at the beginning of the book as well. So it, it, you can, the language there kind of gives us a sense that, yeah, this is, this is winding down. Um, but there's still some um, pretty important uh, things to go over um, in, the, in, those, in, the, in that chapter of Scripture. So we'll be looking forward to going over that um, with you as well. Um, And um, like I said, after we finish with Revelation, um, what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to take some weeks. I don't know how many weeks. I don't think it's going to be too many weeks. Um, I don't know. We'll see. But um, we'll be doing what I what I call tying up some eschatological loose ends, Um, you know, things that uh, we'll go into greater detail on, uh, you know, just different facets of es- eschatology and some topics to cover because there might be some questions on that. And the reason why there might be some questions on that is because they haven't been covered in detail as we go through the book of Revelation. And the reason why they haven't been covered in detail in the book of Revelation is because the book of Revelation doesn't cover those things. You know, I think a lot of times we think that the book of Revelation covers everything eschatological in its greatest detail. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily the case. And if you've been with us throughout the entire study, you know why that is. 
uh, is that while while Revelation covers you know the second coming of Christ, and while that is a big feature of the book, it's not the only feature of the book. Okay, and hopefully you've been able to see that in the book of Revelation, we're not. This isn't a book that's written to give us a detailed explanation of everything, every detail leading up to the second coming of Christ. In other words, this isn't this isn't a a, a play by play you know, of the last seven years or however many years that go on leading up to the second coming of Christ. In fact, if you've, if you've been with us, you know that there have been, we've seen different visions of the end, the same vision of the end, but in different, from different camera angles. So in between those, we've been seeing different visions of the same time period that give us different emphases, different camera angles and that sort of thing. So when we look at Revelation that way, and if we understand that Revelation is not necessarily uh, the the play by play that I that I said before, we're saying okay, this specifically is what's going to happen here, 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 and here, and boom. Then the second coming of Christ. Um, you know, if it's not looked at that way, then it's going to leave us with with other questions. As, you know, just as far as the rapture. You know, what about the rapture? How are we to understand the rapture? A lot of people like to put the rapture at the beginning of chapter four, and I and I've said more than once that I don't think that that's an accurate accurate way of looking at that. So we'll talk about the rapture a little bit, okay? What about the tribulation? I, I've said over and over again, just going through the text of the book of Revelation, um, that um, I don't think that what we're dealing with here is an unfolding of the events of the seven-year tribulation period that leads up to the second coming of Christ in chapter 19. So some people's question might be, okay, well, then if this isn't the, the tribulation, then what does the Bible say about the tribulation? We'll talk about that um, and some other things. I'll just give you a little bit of an idea, okay, uh, what we're dealing with and what we'll, what we, what we'll be uh, looking at and trying to answer some of those questions. Now, um, just as a sort of a segue, because I do address some things, um, and we won't cover everything in the book that we're going to cover in the in the coming weeks, but um, I do want to, again, shameless plug time for my book, Signs of the End, uh, what did Jesus say about his own return and the events that point to it? Um, you can get that at Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com, um, a book about the Olivet Discourse. Um, now, I'll say for one thing that the Olivet Discourse, a lot of people believe that most of what Jesus is talking about in the Olivet Discourse before his description of his second coming has to do with a seven-year tribulation. I say that it does not. If you wonder, if you want to know why, Order a copy of the book, um, and I and I talk about it, okay, um, in in as much detail as I can, um, you know, with scriptural evidence and things like that. So um, go ahead and get your hands on a copy. I will leave a link in the episode description, um, so that you can get that. It will take you straight to the uh, to the Amazon page, um, and uh, you can order a copy there, read it, and be blessed. But for now, let's go ahead and get into our text which again is the last few verses of Revelation chapter 21. And I want to read uh, Revelation chapter 21, verses 20 through, 22 through 27. Okay, and so this is what it says. It says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will, uh, the gates will, will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. There will, uh, they will bring into, into it the glory of the, uh, the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but, uh, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with just as far as our uh, just as far as our text there. And re- so remember what we've been looking at over the past several weeks. I mean, we, ever since getting into chapter 21, we were introduced to, you know, the appearance of the new heavens and the new earth, which is going to be our eternal home um, where righteousness dwells. We're going to live in resurrection life um, and everything like that. And last time, um, and even even in times before last time, we were talking about the New Jerusalem, and specifically last time we talked about the the wonder and the beauty and the splendor of the new of the New Jerusalem. Now remember, and I and I will and I will say this 
I, this might be the last time. I mean, you know, just given you know just what the rest of the terrain of Revelation unfolds, this might be the last time that I have to say this. But remember, 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 remember that when it comes to the new heavens and the, uh, excuse me, the the new Jerusalem that we're dealing with and that we've looked at uh, for all this time, we're not dealing with a literal geographic area of the new heavens and the new earth. And remember, a lot of the dimensions that are that are used in the description of the new heavens and the new earth are used to kind of stretch our stretch things to the limits there. And it, it those things, those descriptions show us that the intention is symbolic. OK, the intentions of the new heavens and the new earth is symbolic. OK, you're not going to have you're, you're not going to have a, a, a city where it's literally the literal thickness of the walls is 200. I think. What did we say? 16, I think 216 miles thick. It's a, that's that's inflated in hyperbolic, you know, dimensions and, and measurements that are given to us to, to prove a point here, to prove the security. And as far as it relates to the the, the precious jewels and everything like that, the beauty of of the new heavens and the new earth. And the reason why, you know, the, we we know that the that the new heavens and the new earth is not going to be a literal city, or at least that's not what the intention is here, is because, again, once again, John tells us what the new heaven, what the, what the new Jerusalem is, um, where he says, or where the angel that was, uh, that was speaking to John, remember earlier in verse nine, he says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Verse 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the bride, the wife of the lamb. Well, yes, that's what that's he does. But that's not what that says there in verse 10. He says he carried me with the spirit, uh, carried me, carried me away in the spirit to a high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. OK, so the new the new Jerusalem is a symbolic picture of the complete and purified people of God. OK, that is what we're dealing with here. OK, and the beauty that's 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 laid out there and the and the um, extraordinary dimensions and measurements and everything like that is supposed to give a, is supposed to explain to us in hyperbolic and in symbolic fashion just the immense security and beauty of the complete people of God, okay? And that's kind of what we went over, that's kind of what we went over last time. And so now, as we as we get into the last section here of chapter 21, um, what, we see, what we see here, we see some specifics as it relates to the makeup of the people of God. And I think it kind of serves as a reminder of things that we've been seeing all along. And even what in, even in some sense, another description of what we, of what we seen last time, just as it relates to the combining of, you know, the gates of the walls and the foundations where you, where it has the names of the 12 tribes of Israel and the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb respectively. Okay. And we talked about how that the combining of those in one structure is supposed to show us God's complete, um, you know, the completion of his plan. Again, as the one who is the Alpha and the Omega, who brings together and brings together this complete people of God. The plan that he had all along, even from times of old in the Old Testament, was carried out through the apostles' ministry and through the ministry of the church in the New Testament. And so now what we have here is a complete people of God made up, made up of believing Jews and believing Gentiles. OK, and so that's what we're dealing with here. And so we're going to get a little bit of a sense of the the the, conti- the the purity of the people of God, you know, kind of in an indirect sort of kind of in a subtle sort of way um, as far as describing it here. I'll show you that here in a second, uh, but also the worship that goes that goes on as well. And we'll and we'll see how the te- our text um, kind of fleshes that out as well. But um to give us an idea, let's just go back to verse 22. In verse 22, we have the first feature there that here that I think is pretty interesting, just as far as it relates to the city. Now, I want this is going to be this is going to be very important for us to understand. I mean, just what we're looking at here as it relates to the city, the the New Jerusalem, which again is the people of God. Because some people get things confused and they think that what some of the descriptions here is what's the description of the entire new heavens and the new earth. Um, and that's not necessarily going to be the case. But I mean, 
just as it relates to the city, the New Jerusalem, again, it says here in verse 22, it says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Now, this might be strange to, you know, maybe initially to our ears, uh, you know, just as it relates to this, this description of no temple being in the city. And that might be because um, in large part, um, you know, we, you know, we wouldn't expect this sort of description to be here. I mean, our minds really don't, I don't think automatically goes to and focuses on this whole thing of temple. But remember, in the description that's being that's being laid out here, we're talking about a new Jerusalem. OK, now, if we're talking about a new Jerusalem in the ancient times, even for people who are Gentiles, maybe I would say, and Gentiles who understood, Gentile Christians who understood, uh, you know, the Old Testament and how things worked and everything like that, you know, the, the prevailing thought may have been, may have been, um, you know, OK, there's a, you know, there's a, a, a new Jerusalem. So does that mean that there's going to be a, you know, in this in this vision of this new Jerusalem, is there going to be a temple? You know, is there going to be a description of a, of a temple? Because that's, you know, you think of Jerusalem, you think temple. That's one of the big glaring um, omissions in the present time that we have now as it relates to the city of Jerusalem is that there's no temple there because the temple was destroyed in, in 70 A.D., now, of course, you know, a lot of people think that there's going to be a future tribulation temple. I don't believe that that's going to be the case. Again, that's I don't want to open up that can of worms or dive into that. Again, maybe that's something that we'll cover in the in the tying up loose ends part of, of things. Um, but um, but you th- I mean, even even if you're looking at this from from a, a purely biblical knowledge perspective, we think Jerusalem, it's not too far off base to think temple. And I think especially in the ancient world, the ancient times, you know, temple would have, you know, it's, it's, it's very much, okay, temple, Jerusalem. And even, you know, and even with, you know, the, the destruction of the temple in 1870, and even with things up to this day and age right now where there is no temple, if we're talking about a new Jerusalem, a description of a new Jerusalem, maybe there's a description, albeit it might be symbolic, but a, a description of a temple there. And the truth of the matter is, is that there isn't a temple. Well, I take that back. There isn't a temple, but there is. And just if you just remember what we just read there in verse 22, you see, you know what I'm talking about. He says, I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God. So it, there's, there isn't a physical temple there, a structure that's built just like it was in the Old Testament uh, during the days of Solomon and whatnot. I mean, so there's no there, there's no temple there. And John said, I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the almighty and the lamb. So the Lord God and Jesus Christ, the lamb themselves, it, you know, God himself is the temple. Now, what does that mean? What are we supposed to what are we supposed to draw, um, you know, from this whole thing? Well, again, you know, what we're I think what we're dealing with here, again, if we understand that the city that's that w- that we've been describing in chapter 21 represents the complete people of God. And if we understand that a temple, at least from what we understand and how what it, what its representation was in the Old Testament as it was with the I mean first with the tabernacle and then with the temple, but you know, it was supposed to represent in 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 a certain sense, not I mean there's other things that it represented I think, but um in large part, one of the things that it communicated was the was the presence of God among his people, okay? And we've talked about this before, okay? I don't think this is anything that's new to us, but you think about the tabernacle, you think about the temple, and you you know, you can't help but realize and understand that even with the temple structure in the midst of the people of his people stationed in Jerusalem, um, that even though that the temple itself was kind of represented God's you know presence, I mean, among his people, and even going further even into there, you're talking about the holy place, and then you have the most holy place behind that curtain there. The presence of the most holy place and the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat and everything like that, you know, showed us that what we're dealing with here is that is is something where there wasn't total and complete access to God. And I think, and again, we're not I'm not saying anything new or earth shattering here, 
But I mean, even as it relates to up close and personal, you know, the presence of God and everything like that as symbol as symbolized in the temple, you know, just anybody couldn't just walk behind that curtain to the Holy of Holies. Otherwise they'd be struck down dead. It could only be, it could only be accessed by the high priest and that once a year and that was, and he was not to go out and go back there without blood. Okay. That was, that was a big no, no. Otherwise he would have been done for. Okay. Now, true in the whole thing of, you know, the, um, the, you know, the whole thing of, of, of our access to, uh, to God as it relates to our salvation in the here and now in the present age. I think we're all very much familiar with what happened to that veil in the temple when Jesus Christ died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, that veil was rent in two. Okay. And that was supposed to symbolize and to show us that the, that the way to God has, has, uh, has been made available through the death, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So that you and I, you and I, our faith in Jesus Christ gives us access into that Holy of Holies in a spiritual sense. I mean, the Holy of Holies itself is, I mean, in the, the physical sense and the temple isn't there anymore. It was destroyed, but we have direct access to God. Now, again, doing a comparison between what we have now in the present age and what we look forward to um, in the uh, in the new heavens and the new earth when we enter into the eternal state, I think what we have here is that you know our our experience as far as the presence of God is heightened to a very high degree, especially if we're talking about the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, being in our midst as well physically. I mean, He's come down to earth. The second coming has happened. Judgment has come, and as it's as it's said in chapter 21 is that we will be his people and God himself will be with us and be our God. So again, as we talked about before, this speaks very much in in intimate terms here of what we're dealing with as it relates to God's relationship with his people. Okay. And I think that this is all the more highlighted in this description in verse 22, when it talks about, I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the almighty and the lamb. So the Lord God Himself is in the Lamb are is the temple, and you know with that with that temple them being the temple there isn't anything that you know is um, that obstructs us or restrains us or keeps us from being in the presence of God and being in the presence of the Lamb in eternity in the new heavens and the new earth, as opposed to in the old in the old order where you had the temple that represented God's presence among his people, there still lacked access. And even so, even today, even though we have full access in a spiritual sense, you know, in the sense that through faith in Christ, we can approach the throne room of God, you know, and we're, I mean, technically, I mean, we're always in his presence, but again, just looking at the, just using the, the language as far as, you know, what the old order and what the old Testament pointed forward to, we can approach God and we can enter into uh, his presence access without, you know, any repercussions because we are in Christ and it's only through Christ that we have that privilege. But now that, you know, the new heavens and the new earth that we're dealing with here is, 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 is going to be a reality. Um, You know, that whole thing of God's presence with us the Lamb's presence with us is seen in a different is seen in a different uh, symbolic uh, in a sim- different symbolic way, and it and it's done that way to, to show us the in, in vivid in a vivid sort of way um, just how things are taken up a notch, just as far as our relationship with God and what it will be like in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, no uh, no encumbrances, but full access to the highest degree in the new in the new heavens and the new earth. Okay. Now, when we get into verse 23, it says, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Um, and let me let me let me go in, in into verse 24 as well, because that's I mean, looking at these two things together is going to be pretty important here. Um, by its light that will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Okay. Now, let's go back to this whole thing of, you know, no need of, you know, sun or, or moon and, and things like that. Um, as it says there, verse 24, um, and the city uh, has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. Now, 
here's where I was mentioning a few minutes ago that's going to be important for us to understand because again, this isn't that what we're looking at here is not John describing the reality of what's going to be the case for all of the new heavens and the new earth. Again, this is the city, and the city has no need for of sun or moon to shine on it. And the reason why I make that distinction is because I think I think a lot of people, you know, just based on this verse, will say, okay, in the new heavens and the new earth, you know, when that is a reality, there isn't going to be sun or moon because God's glory is going to shine forth and everything like that. Now, again, remember that we're speaking symbolically here. Um, even if we're looking at the New Jerusalem as a as a as a literal geographic area in the new heavens and the new earth, for some reason you'd have to explain that there's no sun or moon for the city, but for the rest of the new heavens and the new earth there is. Okay, you see the disparity there. So again, this this whole thing of the description is of the city, the reality of the city, which the city again is symbolically pointing to. The people of God. That's that's what the city represents. That it represents the city of God. So this isn't so this verse isn't saying that in the in the real new heavens and the new earth, once it becomes a reality, the sun and the moon aren't going to exist. I think that the sun and the moon is very much going to exist in the new heavens and the new earth. He's saying here that the city and the city is the people of God has no need for sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. You know, you think about Genesis and you think all the way back to creation, um, you see that the first thing that was created in the Genesis account of creation is light. Uh, God said, let there be light and there was light. And that was before that was before the sun and the moon um, and the stars were created. I believe it, that was on day four. OK, so even there. You know, you have three days after light is 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 created before you have the sun and the moon and the stars and everything like that. So there is this sense of light even before the sun and the moon and everything like that. And so even what you have here in Revelation 21, verse 23, you know, and the city has no need of sun or moon and everything like that. Is that supposed to take our minds back to creation where there was light before there were sun and uh, sun and moon and everything like that? I think perhaps that there is. Now, the question may still remain, okay, well, so what? What does that have to communicate to anybody? Well, the one thing that I would say that that communicates is the fact that the the creation of light at the very beginning, Paul uses that that sort of thing of of creation of of light on day one as sort of a, a picture of salvation in the human heart. Um, if you were to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I believe that uh, the whole thing of, you know, the comparison that Paul is making here is the creation of light um, in the beginning to salvation um, of an individual. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Okay. And so really in a, in a, in a, in a certain sense, you know, I think that, you know, that this is, this is something that's, that's pointing to the light that's, that's being described in Revelation chapter 21 um, as something that points our attention to, you know, the creation of light and that having to do with the gospel and light shining out of darkness. We're going to talk about the whole relevance of light shining out of darkness here in a second. Uh, but it says it has shown in our hearts to give a, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Okay. And I think that that's really what that is. The light that's described in, in Revelation 21, partially what you're dealing with, I think, is is the light that gives knowledge that gives continual knowledge of who God is, revelation of himself and the glories of him and the gospel and everything of of that nature. By the way, I should mention, um, I should have mentioned this up front, but but the whole thing of um, no sun or moon and and everything like that and the glory of God being its light um, is drawn from the Old Testament, which again shouldn't surprise us given the fact that a lot of what's in Revelation is drawn from the Old Testament. Um, But specifically in uh, chapter 60 of Isaiah, um, and in verse uh, verses 19 and 20, it says, The sun shall be no more your light by day, uh, nor, uh, excuse me, the sun 
The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your and your and your God will be your glory. Uh, your sun shall shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Okay. Now this is a description in this chapter about the about the glories of Israel. But as we see here in Revelation chapter 21, we're dealing with something that goes beyond Israel as a nation. And so I think we're, again, the complete people of God, which is, which has been, which God has been in construction of doing that leads up to this point in human history. So the complete people of God, the true Israel in this place, it, you know, it, it being depicted in this picture of a new Jerusalem, um, I think is is pretty uh, is uh, is pretty noteworthy here. Even in uh, in Revelation, excuse me, in Isaiah sixty here, what I just read for you in in chapter sixty. If you were to go back to the beginning of that chapter, and if you were to look at the at the uh, first few verses of Isaiah chapter sixty here, um, you will notice that it says this, and I think that this is pretty noteworthy here where it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And now here, verse 3, And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. So even here, in chapter 60, it was, it's talking about the glory of Israel. I think even with here and within the within this chapter, we're even, we are dealing with a mingling of Gentiles as well. And we see the complete full picture of that here in Revelation. And even with what we see here in, in Revelation chapter 21, as the nations come into it as well, I think that illustrates all the more further, you know, the whole thing of the complete people of God that, that includes uh, believing Jews and believing Gentiles. And and again, listen, if we're talking about the new Jerusalem, again, people usually think Jerusalem, they think Jews, and there's nothing wrong with that. But again, if we're talking about the complete people of God, which is made up of believing Jews and believing Gentiles, then of course, we're going to see nations here, okay, in the new Jerusalem. So in the new Jerusalem, we might think Jews, but we're thinking, but in this chapter, we're thinking this is an expansion here, where the kings of the earth and the nations are going to be participants of this as well. Okay. Now I want to I want to point out a couple of other things just as far as it relates to light and what we're dealing with there. Uh, you know, we, we saw there at the beginning of chapter sixty how there's darkness over the whole earth, but then you know the there's light in Jerusalem, and then the nations shall come to their light. Right. So there's a drawing of that of that light. So we see that you know where, where the nations will come to the light. Uh, we saw that we see that the light reveals, according to you know Second uh, Corinthians chapter four and everything like that. Um, but it's noteworthy here also in places like Matthew. If we were to go to the Gospels, um, and at the beginning of of Jesus's ministry, uh, Matthew chapter four, um, you know where he says here. Let me. If you were to look at, um, let me start in uh, in verse twelve here. Where it says, now when now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And here he's going to quote from Isaiah uh, chapter nine verses one and two, where it says, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death on them, a light has dawned. See that where they were living in the shadow of death before. Now the, the light has dawned. And here, you know, very interesting. The very next verse, it says from that to, from this time, uh, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, of course, we know Jesus's ministry was was aimed specifically to the Israelite people during his earthly ministry, but we know that it's going to expand to the Gentiles um, later after Jesus ascends and after you know the gospel starts to spread in in Jerusalem and then in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay, 
Um, so you have light there that shines on those who are in the shadow of death, as it's as it's mentioned there. You also look at Luke chapter one, and this is the this is the words of Zechariah, who is the father of um, John the Baptist, and the pro- and the prophesying that he was doing, um, you know, at um, at the time of uh, John the Baptist's uh, birth. In uh, Luke chapter one, verses I'm going to start in verse seventy six. Where it says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace." The light shines in the darkness where they're sitting in the shadow of death, and it shows the way. It guides them to the path, of, uh, guides them in the light uh, to the path of peace. Okay, and I and I think that all of those things are very are very noteworthy there because again, notice, and I'm going back now to Revelation 21, where it says, uh, you know, after it says that there's no need for sun or moon and everything like that. Um, and that the light is the lamb in verse 24, it says, and it's, uh, and uh, by its light will the nations walk and the Kings of the earth will bring, will bring their glory into it. So by its light, the nations, the, the, will the nations walk. And so I think taking all of those things together, I think you have a picture of, you know, the light shining so that the Gentiles come in. Now, let me hasten to say, and again, looking at this in symbolic ways is helpful is helpful for, for us understanding this, but let me just say that this isn't a description of salvation that's happening with these other nations in the new heavens and the new earth. We're dealing with saved people here. But again, for our purposes and for our sake, this is supposed to highlight and to illustrate all the more what we're dealing with as it relates to the complete people of God. New Jerusalem, yes. Jerusalem, we think Jews, Yes, if they if they have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But along with that are the Gentiles who are welcomed in and included in the people of God. And what and what's being done here is 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 John is utilizing Old Testament language to bring our minds to that, to highlight that reality here. So this isn't saying that the nations and the kings of the earth and people like that are in the process of being saved here. They're already saved, but we're drawing from Old Testament language to show, to remind us of the reality of, you know, the salvation of people from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation that makes up the complete people of God and who are part of this new Jerusalem, okay? And I think that that's what we're dealing with here. So it says, by its light will the nations walk. And it says, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Now, a couple of things. Number one, you know, I think that, you know, we should, you know, remind ourselves that um, as it relates to the kings of the earth, we have seen the kings of the earth mentioned in Revelation. And most of the time, if not all of the time, um, they're mentioned in very negative ways. Okay. Okay. So, for example, in Revelation chapter 17, remember when we went over this, and in the first couple of verses, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom, now listen, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality in the wine of those whose uh, whose, uh, sexual uh, whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. OK, and remember the whole thing with the with the harlot or the prostitute is that she's decked out in beauty as you go on to, to read the descriptions there in that chapter. And it's supposed to lure people away from the one true God or even uh, from the message of repentance to the one true God. And it's supposed to draw people to herself. And that's where the whole concept of sexual immorality comes in. And as it says there, the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality with her. So luxury, materialism, all those things is is the name of the game there as far as drawing people away. And the kings of the earth are very much entangled into that. And then if you go into uh, chapter 18, one thing that we read in verse 3, it says, uh, For the nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the of the earth um, have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So you see the, the pattern there. This woman is all about riches, luxury, and that sort of thing, and drawing people away. Now, if you skip down, and again, this is still in chapter 18, 
verses 9 and 10, this is after the destruction of Babylon the Great, you know, who is the harlot. It says, and the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. Okay, so so there you see, you know, the kings of the earth associated with things that aren't good in association with the with the prostitute, with Babylon the Great and everything. Now, here in chapter 21, we read about the kings of the earth. Now, what are we to make of all of this, especially if a lot of what we've been reading about the kings of the earth have been negative and bad and people who are against against the one true God? Well, I think the way that we look at this is in the same way that we looked at, for example, the great multitude in chapter 7. The great multitude in chapter 7 who were saved, and they were from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. We know that people from uh, from every tribe, t- tribe, tongue, people, and nation are also seen as people who have persecuted God's people later on in that in that in, in Revelation. But we do see a, a saved remnant there in chapter 7. And the same thing here as that relates to the kings of the earth. So there are there are some people who are considered kings of the earth, people in authority, government, political, you know, whatever like that, who are called out of that out, out of that throng of people who are of the wicked lot, um, and they give their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they're welcomed into the new heavens and the new earth because their names are written in the book of life, you know, you see them in this scene here in chapter twenty one. Okay, and I think that that's what you're what's that's what you're dealing with there. So. You have that going on, but also, you know, which what we see here also is a contrast, okay? In chapter 17 and in chapter 18, in those passages that I just read to you there, um, you know, it's talking about, essentially what it's talking about is is the pursuit of their the kings of the earth. We're just zeroing in, zeroing in on, the, on the kings of the earth. They're not the only ones in view there, but if we just zero in our attention on the kings of the earth, one of the things that we see is that they're pursuing the materialism and luxury that comes from the prostitute, who, by the way, is riding the beast. Okay, so a lot of that, a lot of what's going on there is 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 their pursuit of accumulating wealth and materialism at the expense of repentance to and 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 submitting to the one true God. Okay, but here in Revelation chapter twenty one. Notice what it says there uh, again at the, the second part of verse 24, where it says, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. What does that mean? I think that basically what that means there, and especially if you're talking about the kings of the earth, we're talking about people, that, the, about kings, you know, in this vision who come and they bring their riches and their glory as, uh, you know, kind of as a way of an offering to God. So whatever they have to offer as far as their glory and, and you know, that those things that are valuable and precious and those sorts of things could involve riches. It could involve a lot of other things. They bring that as an acceptable offering to God as they worship him. OK, I think one place to kind of give us a, a picture of what this might look like, if you were to look at places like uh, like uh, Psalm um, Psalm 72 and um, in verses um Let's see here. In verses 10 and 11 of Psalm 72, it says this. It says, may the kings of Tarshish and, the, uh, and of the coastlands render him tribute. And to him is talking about to God. Um, may the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. So basically, I think. I think in a very real way, what we're dealing with here is is worship, you know, bringing gifts and offerings just as, as a form of worship here. Now, again, let me remind you again, okay, that what we're dealing with here is not a literal thing. Because here's the question that people might have in their minds. It says, okay, even in the new heavens and the new earth, are there going to be actual kings and politicians and rulers and people in authority uh, that are going to be existing there? No, I don't think that that's the point. The point is, again, in symbolic picture, we're supposed to see this and it's supposed to it's supposed to um, enhance and highlight the reality of what we're dealing with here. Our understandings of kings are people who are have absolute rule and authority over whatever realm that they that they that they that they, that they rule over. But then you see a vision 
involving kings of the earth who are coming to the new Jerusalem and they're and they're giving their valuable gifts and offerings, their glory, so to speak, as offering as part of their worship of the one true God. And basically, I think that that's what that's supposed that's what that's supposed to show there. And really, in a very real way, this is also supposed to show that you know even for those who are of the redeemed that can't that were kings of the earth that were redeemed in time between the first and second comings of Christ, that they are ones who acknowledge that the one true king is God and Jesus Christ himself. This isn't necessarily supposed to say that these are people who are going to have some form of political or kingdom, you know, or some sort of rule um, over a particular kingdom. I don't think that that's necessarily what the point of this is, but it's supposed to give our under, our minds and our understanding of kings and how they operate and how they how they relate to the one true God who is the true king. So we see kings who are very powerful individuals who are who are submitting themselves fully to the one true God and giving their glory to him and acknowledging him as the rightful king. And that really just brings our mind back to the very beginning of Revelation in chapter one, where it says that uh, where that where that he is the that he is the kings um of um He's the ruler of kings on earth in chapter one, verse five, right? And there we're seeing an, a, an outworking of this in this picture, in this in this symbolic picture right here in verse 24, okay? And so I think that that's, and that's, that's really what we're what's supposed to be, to be depicted there. Now, he bring the, uh, and it says, uh, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it Verse 25, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. Now, some commentaries um, have said, and, you know, as it relates to that, you know, gates not being shut, no night and everything like that, that again, that's, this gives us a picture of the of the absolute security and safety that there, that there is for the people of God. Or if they're looking at it as a literal geographic area, it's like for this actual literal city there, it's going to be a safe place because the gates are always going to be open and there's no night. And we know that at night, you know, there are, there are a lot of, the, you know, violence and crimes and trying to break into the city and that sort of thing is to happen. But I don't, I, but I, and I, I kind of went that way for a little bit, but then I thought, I think that that also might be missing the point as well. Um, we did get a sense of the security of the, of, of the, of the new Jerusalem when we saw how high its walls are, how thick its walls are. And if that wasn't enough, that each gate on the walls are guarded by, by angels, right? Nothing's, nothing's getting in that's, that shouldn't be there, Right. But here we see that the gates that the gates are open here in verse twenty uh, in verse uh, in verse twenty five and its gates will never be shut by day. Okay, so it's always open, and it says there and um, um, as it says there and there will be uh, and there will be no night there. Okay, and I think that the the whole thing of there will be no night there gives us an explanation as to why the gates are always open. OK, because here's the thing. This is what we have to understand. I mean, this was true of Jerusalem or any other walled city or walled community in ancient times is that, you know, at night, you know, the gates were shut, you know, through the gates. You had all sorts of people that might come in and out, whether you had foreigners coming in, whether you had people who were engaging in business and commerce and people were going in and out. People were bringing things in and out and that sort of thing. But at night, when the when 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 night came and the and the gates were closed i mean you didn't have that going on you don't have people going in and out you don't have business being transacted or anything like that between people from outside of the city with people inside of the city the gates are shut people aren't going in and out and and everything like that so there's there's a ceasing of those sorts of things that are going on okay i think that that's what the whole thing of there will be no night there and that's used to explain you know in a in a way you know, just why the gates are always open. And the and the reason why things are described in this way, and I think what this is supposed to communicate to us in a very real way, is that the gates always being open and there being no night shows us that there's going to be a continual stream in and out of the New Jerusalem. Now, again, if, again, this isn't... 
what we have to understand how the book of Revelation works and how symbolism works and all of that stuff. Because again, as we said, you know, the people of God is is depicted by the New Jerusalem. But also what we're seeing is people coming into the, you know, you know, coming into the New Jerusalem, bringing their glory and stuff into it. But we're also seeing and we're also determining that the kings of the earth and these nations and everything like that are people that are coming, uh, you know, that are coming into the city. But they are also the people of God. They have to be because we're de- dealing with the new heavens and the new earth. If they're not of the people of God, they're not going to be here. Okay. So, you know, it, we have to understand how there's a, there's a certain fluidity to you know how the how this how these symbols are 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 rolled out here in this passage here but in this in this picture of the city if you have gates that are always open and there's no night you get a sense you get an understanding and i think the first century audience would have understood this to said okay you know you've got continual in and out you have a lot of business going on, that sort of thing. People are continuing to stream in. And let's just use that term of just streaming in. I don't think, you know, nothing about anybody coming out necessarily in this vision. But, I mean, you have people continually coming in. And I think that that is supposed to give us an understanding of the eternal nature of what we're dealing with just as far as worship of God in the new, in the new heavens and the new earth in its pure, unadulterated form here. Okay? So... You know, you have – so here's what you have here. You have the you have et- the eternality of, you know, of our relationship with God, him being in our presence because of that purity, which all comes from him, which means that there is no physical temple there, but that God himself is our temple and that there's going to be continual ongoing worship of God there as, you know, the kings of the earth and the nations bring their glory into it, which means that they're continuing – to lay up offerings and sacrifices, not literal sacrifices, obviously. Again, all of this is just pictures of using language that people back in that day would have understood. But again, it's it's perpetual worship. It's perpetual offering that's being given up to God, okay? And that's what we, and I think that that's what's supposed to, what we're supposed to understand from that there. Now, does that mean that 24-7, I mean, if I could use that term and apply that to a passage such as this, um, because, again, if you know, you have no time if we're dealing with eternity and especially if you have no sun or moon to mark out times and days and seasons and everything like that, just for the sake of our understanding, you know, is this supposed to mean that 24 seven there's going to be worship of God um, during that time? I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but I think that the idea that we're supposed to have is that there's going to be continual, ongoing unadulterated worship that goes, that comes from a purified people of God with whom God lives in their presence as the temple, as the temple himself. Okay. And as, and God as our temple and as, and the lamb as our temple, he is the one that we continue to approach unabated, unrestrained, the Kings of the earth, as it says, they're bringing their glory into it. Um, and, you know, just having things, uh, that, um, you know, just kind of the worship being continual and perpetual in that way um, in eternity. Okay. Um, verse 26, it says, they will bring into it the glory and, and the honor of the nation. So not just the kings of the earth, but the nations as well. So kings of the earth and everybody in, you know, it's, it's, I mean, if we're talking about rankings or class or anything like that, even people below there, you know, they're, you know, they bring valuable offering and worship to God. And they're the ones who continually bring the glory um, of the nations into this whole thing here. Now, again, I want to bring your attention to the word nations there, because nations, again, if we're dealing with the new Jerusalem, we you know, your mind automatically thinks Jerusalem and thinks Jews. Yes, but notice that the nations are coming in and bringing their glory into this as well which again is supposed to you know bring our minds to the merging of things that creates the complete people of God the nations ethne in the greek which in a lot of in a lot of places in the new testament and particularly as it relates to the plural um was sometimes translated as gentiles okay so here we see you know gentiles coming into the a a a, a jerusalem of sorts 
but of course the new Jerusalem being the people of God and they themselves being the people of God and they themselves worshiping the same God that the, that the Jews did in the old Testament and the same God that the, that the remnant, the Jewish remnant, those who are believers in Christ worship so that they, a lot that, that believing Jews and believing Gentiles together worship the one true God. So again, all of this again is pointing to the complete people of God, his purified bride, uh, who he lives amongst and who serves as their temple within the city. Okay. So they will bring, they will bring into, into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Now, verse 27 says, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. And again, I, I think this is, this draws us our minds all the more to the reality of worship language and worship language that's drawn from the Old Testament. And again, that's something that the ancients would have understood. That's what John's first century audience would have understood as well. Because even if we think about the Old Testament system, if we think about the people of Israel, you know, and what they were allowed to sacrifice, what they weren't allowed to sacrifice and everything like that, you're not going to find them offering unclean things in the alt- uh, on the altar to God. You're not that that's just not anything that you're that you would see them doing. And that would be an offering that would not be acceptable to God. And so in a very real way, you know, if we're talking about here, it says, but nothing unclean will ever enter it. That takes our mind back to, you know, we're talking about us as a purified people. What is impure? Those who are not of God's people, those who rebelled, those who never repented and received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And it's those people, as it goes on, it says, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but those who, but, uh, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So obviously those people who are barred in verse 27 are, are people whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Okay. And that's, and so again, they are said, they are considered unclean. And as unclean people, they are not allowed entrance into the city and they, and they never will enter into the city. And, and in fact, again, as we've seen, uh, as we, as we've already seen, their fate has already been sealed when they were, when they were thrown into the lake of, uh, lake of burning sulfur, when they were thrown into the lake of fire, uh, back in, uh, back in Revelation chapter 20. Okay. So we're talking about complete unadulterated purity, purity of, uh, purity of the people of God based on who they are in Christ and by by that very nature of that the purity of their worship okay um you know th- this isn't going to be anything where the people of God you know are offering any sort of uh impure you know uh, forms of worship or anything like that you know because of dirty hearts or you know or or anything like that or you know their mind is you know, not on God or on Christ or things like that. And a lot of things that we struggle with here that might get in the way, that might hinder our right um, worship of God that we direct towards him. None of that's going to exist um, because of who we are in Christ, because of the uh, because of the eternal state, because of us living in resurrection life, living in perfection. And all of those things are going to go together. But those people who are rebels are on the outside, you know, what else is there to say except that they are that they will not be that they will not gain entrance, uh, g- gain entrance into that, but only those whose uh, whose uh, those uh, who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Which, by the way, you are you and I didn't put our names there, did we? And in fact, if you go back to chapter thirteen, it says it, it, the way that the lamp the uh, Lamb's book of life is described. It says the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. So as it relates to our salvation, your salvation, my salvation in Christ, it was planned before the foundations of the world. I think that that's, I think that that's absolutely incredible. How could we not worship a God like that? But based on his grace and mercy that he's provided for us through his son, Jesus Christ, we have that available. And your name and my name is written on the book of life. And by that, we can gain access into this uh, in this eternal home of the new heavens and a new earth, where our, where our 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 God and our Savior will be with us unhindered, without any physical temple structure, there won't be any need there. All sorts of people, 
will be able to come in who have accepted Christ. And we're talking about people of the nations, you know, every tribe, tongue, people, language, and nation, remnants of the people of Israel who accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all together offer our valuable offerings and worship to God eternally as the gates of the city are always open and they never shut because there's no night. Okay? And so that's the description there of our of our continual, pure, our, our pure and continual eternal worship that happens in eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. And again, this is the privilege that we have as a people of God. And what a, and what a, what an experience that will be, you know, to be able to partake and be able to do all of that and that there will be nothing on the outside that will be able to come in and corrupt and sully or ruin anything you know, just like sin entered into the world in the very beginning, nothing like that is going to happen again. Those people that would bring that sort of cause are are no, are not are not in the picture. They're in the they're in the lake of fire, and there's no fear of you know, well, what if Satan or the serpent or something like that rears his ugly head or anything like that? That's not going to be true either, because guess who's also in the in the lake of fire? Satan, the dragon, the devil. And he's going to be in torment there forever and ever as well. So there's there's going to be nothing and there's going to be no one around to interrupt the pure and eternal worship that's going to take place of our God and of the Lamb. Okay? For eternity. Okay? And again, try and wrap your mind around that if you can. Um, I know, again, for a finite in minds, that, that's kind of hard to imagine and kind of hard to grasp. But that's... That's yours and and my future, you know, in the Savior. And that's something that we can look forward to. And I hope you do. And I hope that this study, and just even as we bring chapter 21 to a close, I hope that this has served as an encouragement to you as we look, as we continue to look forward to that day uh, when we enter into the eternal state. And this beca- and this is our is our perpetual eternal uh, eternal future. And may thoughts of that and what lays ahead for us affect the way that we live in the here and now and how we relate to other people, you know, especially for non-believers, for the lost. We want to go out and we want to we want to preach the gospel to them. You know, yes, God elects and he and he's elected from the foundation of the world. But we are the means he uses us as a means to that end of bringing people to salvation. And so may we be used effectively of him through the power of the Holy Spirit to reach those people so that through faith in him, that this can be the future hope of other people as well. And they will be part of the nations and, you know, that, that keep streaming into the city with their bringing their glory into it. And so it'll be a marvelous thing, all of us together worshiping the one true God as he was meant to be worshiped with the, in the, as the complete people of God. So set your minds and your hearts on that and it's, truly a wonderful thing to to meditate on. Okay, so that brings to an end chapter 21. Like I said, one more chapter of Revelation to go. And like, like I said, once we get done with Revelation, there's probably going to be some episodes where we where we tie, where we tie up some eschatological loose ends. I should mention, and I didn't mention this before, but I should mention that we probably won't go right into that once we finish Revelation. We'll probably take a little bit of a breather, maybe look at some other things before going into that. Um, and then after we after we finish that, you know, maybe do some more standalone episodes or short series um, before maybe starting up on another book. Um, I have an idea um, of what book that might be, although I, I'm, it's not 100% set in stone. Um, so I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want to get people's expectations. And then if I change my mind or if, you know, I feel that the spirit is leading me elsewhere, disappointing you and saying, OK, we're not going to go that direction. We're going to go another direction. So uh, but be praying about that, um, that uh, that, you know, that our our minds and our hearts are directed where the spirit would, would like it to be. Um, as far as it relates to study of his word um, and delving into books of the Bible, all of which are truly, 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 truly rich. And hopefully you've gotten that impression as you as we've been going through this study of the book of Revelation. I hope it's been rich for you. OK, so anyway, we will leave it there. Um, if you enjoy the show and you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to subscribe to my show on Apple Podcasts, also on iHeartRadio, uh, YouTube, Spotify, um, 
and other places as well where you might listen to podcasts. Um, you can also follow me, Steve Gill, on Twitter. The handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S C R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. And don't forget to order a copy of my book, Signs of the End What Did Jesus Say About His Own Return and the Events That Point to It? Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com are the main areas where you can pick up a copy of that book. As usual, I'll leave a link in the episode description so that'll take you straight to the amazon page all right well i enjoyed this examination of scripture as i always do my name is steve gill and i will see you right back here next time bye now